spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX and thanks for joining us for this special episode in lockdown. And we are joined today by South Africa's preeminent, in my view, and many people's views, um, health expert, public health expert, someone who has wide experience in vaccination and public health in drug regulation and is executive director of the Vitz Reproductive Health and HIV Institute. Her accolades are, are too many to mention, but safe to say that I don't think there's anyone better in South Africa to be speaking about the question of COVID-19 with than Professor Helen Rees. So Professor Rees, thank you so much for joining us on SMWX. That's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, we just heard that South Africa will be extending its lockdown till the end of April. And I wondered what your reaction to that announcement is and whether you think this is a wise decision, and, and if so, why? Well, first of all, I think uh, we've been looking at what the impact of the lockdown has been so far. Um, and we recognize that we're not doing nearly as many tests as we want to. Um, but nonetheless, we have seen um, possibly uh, some sort of containment already with fewer hospital admissions and fewer deaths than we might have anticipated had nothing been done. Um, so, so that's only after two weeks, but, but, but we have to be cautious how we do interpret that data. But nonetheless, what we really want to do, and everyone's heard this expression, is flatten the curve. If we had let things just go with doing nothing, we could have anticipated the same sort of scenario we've seen elsewhere. And that is mm. that, that, that you get a slow takeoff and then a very rapid increase in cases and deaths, which health facilities simply can't cope with. And so your death rate is, is much, much higher. If you can control contact and push that curve from that down to this, you allow time for the health facilities, social services, all of the facilities that need to be prepared for an increase in numbers of cases to be ready. Um, that is, I think, what we're seeing. But it, it, and we've done, I think, very well so far in two weeks, but we're not where we want to be yet in terms of readiness. So to actually extend for an additional two weeks on top of the three weeks is a very good idea at this point. So this is, of course, about flattening the curve, but also about trying to buy ourselves some time to make sure that once we come out of lockdown, the next phase of the strategy is, is in place and, and can work immediately. Yes, I mean, it's not only once we come out of lockdown, but it's, it's, it's actually also what, it, what we anticipate is that we will, like every other country, start to see the numbers of cases and the numbers of hospitalizations and sadly the number of deaths increasing. What it's going to do is allow us to be able to respond to that as an emergency, but also, as you say, to think about all the other social aspects, economic aspects, um, and to think on our feet as a country. We're not the same as Italy. We're going to have to think of different solutions and what's going to work socially and economically for us um, as this um, outbreak proceeds. Now, one of the, the questions that's sort of uh, caught fire on social media is this question of, of vaccination. And of course, you have wide experience um, in vaccinology and, and you have thought through questions of vaccination, not just now in this immediate crisis, but also, you know, across a wide range of, 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 of questions. Um, why do you think it's important um, that we in South Africa get serious about this question of vaccination? And just take us through your, your general thoughts about, you know, how long a vaccine might take. Well, I'll start with your question of why it's important first. Um, what, what I think all of the world's experts are anticipating is that we're not going to get rid of the COVID-19 virus quickly, that it's going to be with us for quite a long time. Um, we, we're talking about the first wave, which is what we're at the beginning of now in South Africa, but you might get through the first wave and what you're seeing in China, for example, is you get a bit of a second wave. They're getting a second wave there because of imported cases. If they didn't control that, you'd get a second wave because still the majority of people in your population will not have been exposed to the virus and so forth and haven't built up any immunity. Mm. But then beyond that, the other thing that we're all concerned about is that this virus becomes what's called endemic, that it becomes 
sort of like seasonal flu, that it's with us all the time. And it might be seasonal, it might come like flu does in the winter months, but it might actually be with us all the time with the significant mortality and the significant hospitalization that goes with it. So even if we can get through this acute phase now, we're also looking to the future to say, we're going to have to do something to actually stop this virus in its tracks completely. That's where the vaccine comes in, because uh, we're looking at the moment for good therapies, things to treat people who are very sick. We're looking at drugs that might protect people. But in the long term, the best public health intervention is a vaccine. And I think, you know, all of you know this. I mean, we know that as children, you know, we get immunized against measles and then we won't get measles. And that's a deadly disease that kills hundreds of thousands of people without vaccine. The same here. Vaccine is the critical public health intervention that we need to develop. So that's the, the, the first point. Mm. Mm. The and, second and thing just, is... Just, just yeah. on that, because you, you have been speaking about how it's important that South Africa actually plays a role in, in vaccination and we don't simply accept um, vaccines or, or vaccine projects from outside, but play a crucial role in the scientific process of developing that vaccine for our context. Yes. Well, the, 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 the people who are really looking to develop vaccines in the very early phases in the laboratory and are, are looking at that are, of course, the, 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 the countries with a lot of resources that have had been doing a lot of vaccine research, but also China. I mean, China, you know, was the, the that had the start of this outbreak, has a, a, a good scientific base, and they are looking also to develop vaccines in their early phases. So around the world, there are a number of vaccines, well over 40, nearly 50 vaccines that are in early stages of development. They're either in the laboratory or um, in animal models or both. And some have now moved into the early phases of clinical trials. So with a vaccine, you look for something that, you, first of all, you look at what is this pathogen? What is this, this thing out there that you want to attack and stop infection? In this case, it's the coronavirus. So we looked at the coronavirus, we look at the genetic material, you look at the structure of, of, of that virus, and you say, how can you develop a vaccine that will recognize that virus when it comes in? Um, so the, the body is primed to say, I see this virus, I'm going to attack it. I have antibodies, I will attack it. That's what a vaccine does. So, and you, in order to do that, you have to offer the body something that tricks it into thinking it's seen the coronavirus. It's not seeing the coronavirus, it's seeing, say, a part of it, a bit of its, its genetic material or a bit of its structure. The body mounts a response to the vaccine and that response is remembered. So when the, the vaccine, when the virus comes back in, the body's re immune response immediately gets triggered and will respond. And that's how you get protection. That's how vaccines essentially work. So the early phases of these clinical trials that we've seen, and there are about seven at the moment, are being done in the countries where these vaccines have been initially developed. So the UK, the US, Australia, and China. These are small trials with healthy people who are volunteers, who, and all we're looking at is what dose of vaccine needs to be given. Is it safe? And does it appear to stimulate the immune system in an individual. So those are, what are, those are the early small trials, and they might have, say, 50 people, small numbers, and you first do that before you go into larger studies. Mm. But once you go, once you've proved that, you really want to take this vaccine into populations who might be exposed to this virus to see if it's, it's likely to work and if it's going to be safe. So that you have the next phase of vaccines, larger numbers of people in more diverse populations, and then finally, these very large trials with thousands of participants to actually test whether the vaccine is going to work against the virus. Right. Now, in terms of the question, does South Africa, do African countries want to be involved? We absolutely do. We want to know in our own settings whether these vaccines work for our populations. Are they safe? Are they effective? Um, we want to be part of this global scientific endeavor. Um, uh, which will involve probably many of the countries of the world. But South Africa in particular has a strong scientific base, very good researchers, people who are able to do vaccine trials. We definitely want to be part of this. We don't want just Northern Hemisphere countries. 
We want north and south. We want it to be a global effort and we want it to be done to the highest possible standards and, and ethically implemented. Now, um, you, you mentioned antibodies and I know that in, in other parts of the world, there, there are questions now about introducing antibody tests in addition to testing for whether people actually are infected. Could you take us through whether you think South Africa will, will be able to institute such a strategy, whether you think such a strategy would be wise as well? Well, at the moment, because as I say, we're in the early stages of the epidemic locally, um, what we're testing for are people with acute infection. So there we're testing to see if we can detect signs of the, the virus. So as you know, people have swabs taken and then the laboratory looks to say, can we identify that? That's an acute infection. But what the body does is after you have this acute infection, it mounts this antibody response. It's the way the body fights off the infection. And once you've cleared that infection, if we then test you, we're able to find antibody. The virus will have long since gone, but we can see that you've been exposed. So the advantage of antibody later on in an outbreak like this is that you can actually do cross sections of the population, people perhaps who are at risk like healthcare workers and say, what's happening there? Or populations where we think there might be particular risks in you know, some of our high risk communities where we know there's overcrowding. Is there a hot spot going on there? And by testing for antibodies, you can get an indication of how the outbreak is, is progressing how many people have been exposed? How many people have been exposed possibly with asymptomatic or mild symptoms, didn't even know they had it? And we get a picture of, of what's actually happening as the, the weeks go by quite quickly. But if you test for antibodies early, like now, you're gonna get very limited information because we're still just capturing acute cases, in which case we're not gonna get much information from antibodies, but we will see antibodies being used progressively more as mm. the as as time goes on now you, you have um a great deal of experience um in the in the hiv research space um how how is this different to what you've experienced there and when did you kind of realize that this was serious well, I'll start with HIV. Of course, HIV is, 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 uh, is differently spread. It's, it's spread mostly through, through sexual contact. Um, so the, the nature of the spread, it's, it's, it's harder to get, first of all, than this coronavirus, than the, the COVID-19 virus. So, so it's, it's, a, it's different. So the interventions are totally different. Um, and uh, we've also now got treatment, but it took us a long time to develop to the point where we've got treatment, but we still don't have a vaccine, which is what's needed there. Um, there are certain things that I think we must learn. One is the importance of engagement of communities and the importance of information and accurate information. Um, the second is that we must avoid at all costs stigma. Once you have stigma uh, and uh, people people will become reluctant to test if they have symptoms. Families will be reluctant to, to tell neighbors. We, we must avoid stigma. And we learned that very strongly from, from HIV. We should all accept that we're going to have high rates of infection with the coronavirus and that uh, we must uh, look after people who are infected, but not in any case uh, stigmatize. So I think that those are some important lessons. The third mm. thing though, which is very important at the moment, is that we're using the same workers who are experienced with going out into the community uh, mm. for HIV and TB, for tracing, for finding people who've uh, not come for their antiretrovirals, to actually trace people, talk to people in the community. Those people with community skills are now, have now taken on the COVID-19 role. Mm. Uh, they are the ones that have been retrained and they're going to households asking questions, identifying people who appear to have the, the symptoms that might suggest infection. Nurses will take the blood. So we're using those same workers who've got extraordinary experience of, of community linkages and understanding to now take on the COVID-19 work. And, and then just finally, 
given that the prevalence of, of HIV is relatively high in South Africa, um, what kind of um, worries do you have about the potential of comorbidity, I guess, if that's the right term? Um, is there any thinking um, going on at the moment about how one might affect the other? Well, we, we've learned a lot from China. I mean, from China's documentation of, of who's most at risk. Um, and as you say, they found that people with certain comorbidities were at high risk, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease, um, but people who are also immunosuppressed. So some people, for example, with cancers, um, but anything that causes immunosuppression. And that's why we have the concern about um, HIV. Now, having said that, um, we are hopeful that the major majority, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's probably 50, 60% of people living with HIV in South Africa are on antiretrovirals. So the first thing that's incredibly important is that we're able to keep supplies of antiretrovirals going for people living with HIV so that they're able to <clears throat> suppress their HIV infection and keep their immune system intact. That's incredibly important. But we also know there are a lot of people out there who either don't know that they have HIV or for whatever reason have chosen not to access treatment or have been unable to access treatment at this time. And those are the people we're particularly worried about. And we're going to be watching very closely to see where the rates of infection are higher with the coronavirus in people living with HIV um, generally, um, but, but in particular, uh, people who might not be aware of, of, of their HIV infection. Well, Professor Rees, thanks so much for taking time out of what must be one of the, the busiest schedules in South Africa uh, to chat to the SNWX audience. And we thank you and salute you for all the work that you continue to do. Well, thank you very much. And I think you're, you're um, because I suspect that more young people looking at this, the one thing this is, is to say is that young people, young people are not immune. That was a mistake that in the US people made. Mm. That is not true. Um, and even if you get a mild illness, the risk is that you can then take it back into your home where you might have grandparents or people with comorbidities living. So please look after yourselves. Don't regard yourselves as this is not my worry, it's someone else's. It should be our collective worry. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Point well taken. And thank you so much. All the best during this difficult thank moment. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susie. Thanks for watching the content. Like, share and subscribe on all platforms. smwx.co.za to join the WhatsApp channel. And let's build a new conversation for a new generation. Are you, are you?